watching Reason and Theology Live. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examinations. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Your host, Michael. On a Wednesday, we are continuing our lecture series here on the Roman liturgy, joined by River Run, who's going to continue this for us. He's going to be going over the various parts of the Roman liturgy. Uh, welcome back to the show, River. How are you? Good, Michael. Doing pretty good. good. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's good to have you back on. And everybody, we will have uh, live participation. Just make sure to um, maybe send your hold off on sending your questions until towards the end. So maybe wait about 20 minutes or so. Okay. Uh, we'll do some prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty and ever-living God, your eternal Son humbled himself not only in becoming man, but also in giving us his flesh and blood to eat and drink. Help us learn to worship him with devout attention and to, be to benefit from his unfathomable gifts. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Father. Okay, so um, what we're to talk about now is uh, the structure of the Mass, and before, because what did we talk, we've talked about, um, uh, recall, and it's been a minute, but we've talked about the um, spiritual reality of the Mass, and uh, uh, as it is, active participation, as it's called. And we've talked about um, the elements of the Mass. So last time I talked about um, gestures. I recall mentioning haptic gestures, that is to say gestures that impart into the body um, uh, appropriate attitudes towards worship. I talked about words and language. Uh, I talked about, I think very briefly, sacred um, objects and possibly sacred space. Um, and this is just by way of recollection. Uh, this time, uh, we want to talk about the parts of the Mass, at least as much as we can cover, and we're going to cover the parts of the Roman Mass in particular. Uh, there, are, Of course, the parts of the Mass vary somewhat. Uh, I don't feel uh, specifically competent to cover the parts of the Eastern liturgies, and uh, not all of these parts are essential and not every expression of the parts of the Mass um, uh, is essential either. So uh, we shouldn't fret that the Eastern Rites may uh, have or not have some of these, and we shouldn't fret that the Eastern Rites may uh, express or not express uh, these different parts in different ways. That's okay. Now, oh, I <laughs> lost my mouse. Now, the, we want to have a recollection again of the spiritual purpose, the spiritual life of all of the liturgy and specifically of uh, the Mass so that we can understand why it might not so much matter. Um, and so I wanted to talk about, again, just by way of recollection, the mystery uh, memorial aspect of the Mass. Um, and as well as the uh, sacrificial aspect of the Mass. Now, I'm uh, running from uh, Miller's uh, The Fundamentals of the Liturgy from 1955. You can get that on archive.org, and I've also bought a copy. It's hard to get as a purchased copy. Um, but there's a lot of texts that uh, say the same thing before the Council. So I uh, sort of want to talk about, again, by way of recollection, um, what the Mass is. So now he uh, turns our minds to uh, the consecration prayer, unde et memorores, uh, et memorores. Um, in English, that's going to be, um, therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the blessed passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ, your Son, our Lord, we, your servants, and your holy people, 
offer you this glorious majesty from the gifts that you have given us, this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life and the chalice of everlasting salvation. So the reason he points us to this prayer is because it's an indication in the very liturgy itself of the twofold spiritual reality of all um, Eucharistic liturgy, but particularly the Roman Mass. Now, this is that prayer is also sometimes called the anamnesis. It's in, uh, to my knowledge, all liturgical rites. Miller says it's in all liturgical rites. I'm sure there may be some obscure one where it's not there or impartial, but it's it's in the major forms of liturgy in the church. And um, the point is to again to have you recall that the reality of the Mass is recollection uh, or memorial. And he says about it, and I don't want to get it here because it's it's just so important. And if you don't have it, you won't you won't have anything. So let's see. Okay. This prayer, the Unde et Memoris, called the Anamnesis, is to be found in every liturgy of the church, both Eastern and Western. This fact ser serves to bring out a very basic aspect of the Mass, recognized clearly and explicitly by the entire church. That is, it is a memorial of Christ and his salvific acts. Indeed, it is almost as important as the sacrificial aspect of the Mass. It is a theme that we find constantly recurring in the writings of the fathers of the church, at least as frequently as the sacrificial theme. Such a memorial of the facts of redemption is both essential and basic to Christianity. Jungman insists Christianity is a historical religion based on the coming of God's Son, who redeemed man at a certain time and place. Our spiritual life depends completely on a special intervention of the divinity in human history, and it is extremely important that we always bear this in mind. The temptation is all too great to succumb to a religious naturalism. We are very prone to make religion, uh, the religious apostolate, revolve about our human qualities, our personality, our administrative ability, our human cleverness. We are sometimes, uh, it, we act as sometimes as though we can lift man up to God without God's help. This was the attitude of the Renaissance period, and it's even an attitude now. He goes on to say, <laughs> no can. Let's see. He wants to talk about this idea of memorial, and it's the idea of the presentation of Christ. This memorial takes the form of a mystery rite, in the sense that term is used by ancient Christian writers, that is to say, the reenactment of the work of our salvation under a symbolic veil. In the words of Odo Cassell, the mystery is a holy ritual action in which a salvific act is made present in the rite and brings salvation to the cult community which participates in it. According to the secret of the ninth Sunday after Pentecost, as often as the commemoration of this victim is celebrated, there is wrought the work of our redemption. And then he wants to talk about this. So, and this is the key paragraph. And I don't know that I conveyed it well the first time, but I, uh, if I did, great. And I want to convey it over and over again. Because why? Because if it's not understood that we're making present Christ through all of the Mass, through the liturgy of the Word, through prayers at the foot of the altar, through the offertory, through the preface, through all of it, then we just have empty... You see, why is this important? Because if you think of the memorial as simply a natural memorial, just as let's remember that Jesus existed, which is, it's not a natural memorial, that's weird. But if you think of it that way, what's the Mass, really, structurally? Well, the Mass ends up being uh, a lot of words to bring to mind Jesus, uh, who then only shows up at the Mass at the words of consecration. That's not correct. Um, and that's a big deal because if you think that way, 
really the whole mass becomes modular, strictly speaking. I mean, the, and this was a problem before the council in a certain way that people pretend wasn't true, um, not in the liturgy itself, but in the practice of the liturgy. Namely, look, we only have to care more or less about when Christ appears, which is exactly at the words of consecration, and the rest of it is just dressing. Like, you know, you you, you could get, you get very naturalistic here. As he says, it would just sort of be the beginning part of the liturgy is sort of personally preparatory. It's kind of a, uh, a group devotion. And then we have an education period. Uh, and then we have, you know, some hymns that and some confessions that uh, remind us what we're supposed to be doing. And then we get ready to bring uh, Christ present. Uh, then when Christ is present, we, we have to very much care about that. Uh, and then uh, after the sacrifice, uh, Christ is put away in the tabernacle. Uh, and then it's just back to us. Uh, doing whatever, and that's not correct. And his, so again, as he says, what is this work of redemption that is made present? Certainly, the sacrifice of Christ, but not in its historical reality. It is not a death that, that takes place, but the sacrifice achieved through that death. This is the meaning of the sac the sacramental signs. That is the sacrificial body and blood of Christ. Therefore, the Christus Passus, not the Christus Patiens, is made present. However, the work of redemption did not stop with the death of Christ. That would have been a purely negative ending. He came, he died to bring a new life of grace, achieved in his resurrection, a life of grace blossoming into eternal life in heaven, exemplified in his ascension. These two mysteries, therefore, are made present, at least as far as their virtue or effect are concerned. For it is not the death of Christ who is made present through the transubstantiation, but the glorified Christ who can die no more. These three mysteries, passion, resurrection, and ascension, make up the central work of redemption. Let's see. And this is the primacy of the memoir. Now, he says also, however, at the beginning of this description, because, of course, when we describe the rites, we're going to start at the beginning of the Mass. When someone close to us dies, we do everything we can to keep his memory alive in our minds. We zealously collect and preserve the things he used during his life. We set up his portrait. I have one right here and another right here. These are my own family members. We set up his portrait in a place of honor where we will often see it. We recount his virtues and various good deeds. We may write his biography, even erect a monument to his memory. Yet, try as we may, this memory will live in our minds and hearts only. We cannot bring him back or make him truly live physically anymore in our midst. And the great power or influence which he may have exerted among men, the works he may have started might live on in some fashion, aided through our efforts, but they are no longer his power, works, or action. They are now performed by others. This is not the case with Christ's memory. It is not only his memory that lives on. That very memory brings him and his work to us in all their original vitality, freshness, and reality. We who have come so late on the stage of human history were not privileged to see and touch the Son of God made man. Yet he is here, his flesh, his blood, his soul, his divinity. We were unable to witness the great drama of redemption wrought for us by Christ's heroic sacrifice on the cross and accepted by God through the resurrection of, and ascension. Little worry for the mass we have, for in the mass we have the same body and blood as they were once immolated on Calvary, arose from the dead on Easter morning, and ascended into heaven 40 days later. We have not simply the empty sepulcher present, nor just a picture of our heroic Savior. Our memorial rite of the mass reenacts sacramentally that which it commemorates. That is to say, the Mass makes real what it presents in the whole Mass, not just in the sacrifice, but in the instruction of Christ that we have in the Liturgy of the Word, in our own union of ourselves with Christ in the Offertory, 
in the actual um, uh, words of institution, in the communion rite, in the closing rite, in the preparatory rite. And that, that was a long introduction, but it's important because everything else is just dry and academic if that's not understood. So now, what are the parts of the Mass? So there's two principal parts of the Mass and then two lesser parts of the Mass. Um, this, this is sometimes chopped up a little different in terms of terminology in the older books. I'm using the contemporary structure of the Mass um, with particular reference to the, um, uh, the, the uh, pre-reform liturgy in my mind, but you can break up the pre-reform liturgy uh, th this way as well. It, it's not a big deal, but the terminology was not settled to my understanding until after the reform where it was put in the rubrics of the mass or uh, in the order of the mass. So the two principal parts are the liturgy of the word and the liturgy of the Eucharist. Now, obviously, the liturgy of the word is where we have the readings and the intercessions, etc. And the liturgy of the Eucharist is where we have the offertory, uh, the prayer and the communion rite. And then the lesser parts are the introductory rites and the concluding rites. Um, the content of the introductory rites uh, in the new mass is somewhat different. Uh, from the content of the introductory rites in the old mass, and the um, content of the concluding rites is somewhat the same. Um, but we'd have to go into that in detail, and that's more for the lectures on the history of the reform of the mass. Now, let's see. Let me pull them up. So again, remember, the four structures of the mass are the introductory rites in order, in temporal order. Introductory rites, liturgy of the word, liturgy of the Eucharist, concluding rites. And then the principal divisions are liturgy of the word and liturgy of the Eucharist. That is to say, that's when we come to Mass, it's those two parts are the things that we are leading into and coming out of. So the introductory rites are meant to basically get you ready to do the principal parts. So they're getting you ready to do the liturgy of the word and they're getting you ready to do the liturgy of the Eucharist and the transitions between the liturgy of the Eucharist uh, and the liturgy of the word are meant to, you know, get you into each part. And the concluding rites are meant to sort of bring you out of doing the principal parts in an appropriate way. So that's, that's, that's what, when we say they're principal parts, we're not saying that they're just tack-ons or whatever, but we're saying that the, um, the secondary parts are in service of the two central parts. Okay. Now let's see. Let me get to Miller's exposition here so that I can keep on uh, good order. Why am I having, excuse me, I'm having a technical difficulty. In any case, so we'll talk about the introductory rites first. I don't know why it's doing this. If I have to go through the, from the book, I'll do that. Very odd. Excuse me. My reference is having a total collapse. Okay. There we go. Opening right. Okay. So... The, this is the part of, so he calls it the opening rites, but they're the introductory rites. So in the contemporary rite, the, uh, the introductory rites are as follows. Entrance and veneration of the altar, sign of the cross, greetings, Lord be with you, etc. The act of penance, I confess, the Kyrie, and then on appropriate times, the Gloria, and then the collect. Now, uh, with the older Mass, it was similar, although you have it more as um, uh, the Incipit. So, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, Introibo Antari Dei, that is sometimes called the prayers at the foot of the altar. 
Uh, and then, of course, uh, Auditorium Nostrum in Nomini Domini, qui fecit celum et terra, uh, with the, the, um, uh, the confidio uh, then starts properly, which is analogous to our present thing. And then, um, how do you have it? And then again, uh, additional longer prayers. And then you start something more analogous to what we do now, which is the Indroid. Uh, psalm verse, uh, 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 re repetition of the Android, and then the Kyrie. Um, so uh, we won't go into the history of this too much, but the prayers at the foot of the altar are an insertion from Gallican liturgy uh, about the 11th century. Um, they were previously done either in the sacristy or on the way to the altar. And then uh, by the time of the uh, liturgy of uh, Trent, it becomes mandatory to recite them uh, at the foot of the altar at the beginning. Um, the closest analog you, you might be familiar to. So like sometimes you'll see um, in churches uh, or with uh, traditional um, priests vesting prayers, uh, it's like that. So the prayers that you say while well, you're putting on, um, uh, you know, the cassock or the surplus or whatever, um, the uh, interable ad altari dei is, is like that. Um, namely, it's a prayer that's preparatory for the celebrants uh, before they approach the altar. And it became mandatory, and I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing, but when the liturgy was reformed, uh, and then we'll go over the history of it. It's not necessary to do that now. That's for another show. But when the liturgy was reformed, the desire was to bring back the Roman rite to its primitive sources. And that meant stripping away a large portion of Gallican accretions, um, including uh, prayers at the foot of the altar. Also, uh, I think it was thought, at least from what I can gather from sources, that uh, the prayers of the altar are somewhat redundant in the Roman Rite, given that the Roman Rite already has a group penitential act uh, that serves for both the clergy um, and uh, the, uh, the people. Um, so the special prayers are not necessary, although it could, you, know, you could have something like that for particular emphasis. Um, and also, they, of course, move the penitential act to a group act uh, so as to reduce the redundancy, because by 1960, you had um, you had the penitential act at the beginning with the serve uh, with the um, uh, celebrants. And then you had it again uh, right before communion. Uh, and that that was I mean, even now, if you have a if you go to a parish that that does that, it was um, it's it's a little odd. So um, this was a sort of um, compression uh, uh, on, on uh, penitential operation in the right. Okay. Now, let's see. Talked about the opening right in terms of the prayers at the foot of the altar. Um, let's see. The Android Antiphon, now uh, we won't go into the history of this too much, but the Android Antiphon changes, and uh, in history it was longer um, than now and in the prior rite. In fact, it would tend to be a, um, a uh, so you'd have, in this case, for instance, uh, I just pulled up today, uh, the Android Antiphon is, Forsake me not, O Lord my God, be not far from me, and hasten to help me, O Lord, my salvation, which is Psalm, part of th Psalm 37. Well, what you would have done, um, and then you've got three, then you've got one psalm verse today, and then uh, a, a verse, so uh, uh, glory be to the Father and the Son, as it was in the beginning, is now. So that's the structure. Well, that's just two verses. So back in the, back in the earliest sacramentaries we have, it would be the, um, it would be, a, a, the, this would be an antiphon, and then you'd, do, you'd go through all of Psalm 37, or at least until the celebrant determined you didn't need to, uh, I presume by the shortening that the celebrant probably ended up cutting it down a great deal. Um, and then uh, you'd, you'd finish it out, and the, the whole scholar would do that. Um, and sometimes with the people, uh, but it's not clear from our sources. Um, 
there is a tendency to simplification in the Roman right. Uh, and you see longer things. The, the, you could think about this. The, the embellishment in the Eastern rites is, is more um, like some things we have in the primitive sacramentaries. Uh, I mean, just very long chants, very long uh, hymns uh, with whole groups. Um, we have some of that in the older rites, um, and uh, th that tends to get streamlined. And then other things get brought in from Gallican rites um, uh, to sort of pad things out. But the padding out in the Roman rite tended to be symbolic and allegorical rather than length in terms of prayers, as you might understand in the Eastern rite. The Eastern rites uh, tend towards length of prayers. Uh, the history of Roman reform before the present reform has been to uh, embellishment with symbolic gestures, and those are different uh, and tend not to increase the length of activity. Uh, then you go to the uh, Kyrie. Uh, the Kyrie in the present form has a number of forms. Uh, these forms um, are taken from uh, older sacramentary practices and uh, repurposed for the present liturgy. Uh, the old one was sort of just Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, etc. Um, in the older liturgies, uh, that litany could be very, very long uh, and uh, probably uh, or seems to have included what we would now call prayers for the people uh, at some points, but then that's also been dropped. You have the collect for the day. The collect for the day is very important as part of the introduction. Um, the same thing in the contemporary right. The collect of the day is a kind of focus. So, uh, I mean, it's serious. You're supposed to take it serious. The priest is supposed to take it serious. And you're to listen to it, and it is, as it were, to set the... Um, Miller says the mood. I don't think that's quite the right word, but it's certainly to set something like the, uh, the prayerful tone of the mass for the day. So it, it's important. So what is today? For instance, uh, let's see, we have it in um, the new rite. Keep your family, O Lord, schooled always in good works, and so comfort them with your protection here and lead them graciously to gifts on high through Jesus Christ our Lord, etc. And the old one was, um, look mercifully upon your people, we beseech you, O Lord, and grant that they whom you command to abstain from food may also refrain from harmful vices through Jesus Christ our Lord. In both cases, it's um, it's instructive uh, in the older right, emphasizing, of course, uh, conformity with fasting. Um, and uh, in uh, the new one, uh, sort of schooled in good works. So again, uh, uh, the new, new liturgy tends to expand on theme and then uh, uh, give an elaboration. But either case, you're to listen to the collect and it's to focus what's going to go on afterwards. Let's see. Let's see if Miller has anything important here. Uh, then sometimes, not always, the Gloria is said. Let me pull up so that I might have something interesting to say. There it is. Um, so the Gloria is the, in the history of the Roman rite, it's the first hymn. Um, which is interesting. I mean, there's other hymns, but I mean, in it's the first r set liturgical hymn. Um, everything else were um, um, psalms. Psalms aren't hymns per se, uh, and they're scripture um, and sort of chants and responses. But um, the Gloria is the first instituted church song to be sung. Um, its themes are interesting. So if you don't, of course, you know the glory, but we'll say it again. Glory to God in the highest and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you. We give you thanks and we praise uh, you for your glory. Of course, sort of, again, the whole point of these. And th of course, this is where the glory is said on particular days. You don't want to say it all the time because there's a kind of trivializing factor. And there's a, you know, so when you have insertions, um, you know, there's a tendency to want to have the insertion for a particular reason rather than to generalize. And of course, not always. But um, the Gloria, and of course, in its elaboration, in its choral elaboration, meant to call you, what is the first line? Call you to God directly in a um, uh, hymnological way. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father. So God's 
majesty. What do we do? We worship you and give you thanks. We praise you for your glory. Let's just say this is especially to move the heart to worship uh, God's high majesty. Then we move to Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God. Again, God as Christ. What does he do? He takes away the sins of the world. He affects our redemption. Have mercy on us. We need your mercy. We need your uh, strengthening grace to be able to do any of the things that we're asking for. Where is he? He's seated at the right hand of the Father. So he shares in the majesty of the God we've already addressed. And he but receives our prayers. And then the last um, set of verses, you, for you alone are the Holy One, you alone are uh, the Lord, you alone are the Most High, seems particularly anti-pagan, um, uh, you know, in, in the context of the early church. I think this is instituted around four or 500, if I recall. Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit to, uh, in the glory of God the Father, amen. So again, the full Trinitarian unity. We're, we're dealing with, we, historically, we're dealing with a lot of things uh, at once in that last set of verses of paganism, of course, but also it seems to be anti-Trinitarianism of various kinds, uh, certainly um, Arianism, uh, certainly any view that uh, diminishes the position of the Holy Spirit relative to the rest of the God. Um, and again, it's, it's put on special days. This can be thought of, you know, different ways. Um, uh, but I mean, again, the the oomph of you don't want to lose the as it were the oomph of the glory. You don't want to lose its special significance. Let's see. Um, in con no, no, that's not now. That's later. Now we go to the reading service. So this is about the lectionary. The history of the lectionary and the Latin rite is interesting. Um, uh, and again, I don't, I'm not focused specifically on history, but, um, unfortunately I have to talk to get much significance out of talking about the lectionary. Uh, there's a spiritual significance, but there's also a, a historical development and because of the diversity of rights, some words need to be said. So, uh, traditionally, not always. So the traditional form of this part of the mass, however you want to do it, is um, reading psalm of some kind. Uh, the gospel has to be in there. To my knowledge, there's no rite of the church where there's no gospel. Um, and then uh, a homily when appropriate. And that structure is in, in the liturgy, uh, in, the, um, in, in the divine office, in the liturgy of the hours as well. So that structure, and that structure is in ancient texts as well. So that basic template of readings of various kinds, psalm, gospel, um, and then homily, uh, it seems fixed in church history from the beginning. Now, the big variability is um, which readings. So, um, like in some of the, I think it, he says in the, the Syriac churches, uh, you can have up to six readings. So it would be three Old Testament readings, uh, and then three New Testament readings. And then I don't remember if he says, and then the gospel. So I don't know if that's three epistolatory readings or and then the gospel, or if it's uh, one of those is the gospel. I, I wasn't clear from this text and I'd have to look and that's not what we're doing right now. But in, uh, in the primitive Roman rite, uh, it seems to have been three readings, one Old Testament, um, one New Testament, and uh, epistolatory, that is, and then a gospel. And then uh, it appears that the cycle became simplified primarily, but not only to an epistolatory reading and a, um, a gospel reading. Um, and, if, and of course, the uh, lectionary reform has switched that around. Uh, this practice of having, uh, a, a, as it were, a liturgy of the word is generally thought to have come from a primitive. So, I, I don't like saying it exactly this way because it's a little misleading, but um, it seems to have been expected amongst Jewish converts that you would have, um, as it were, an instructing service, um, a, a liturgical recitation of the word of God with um, a homily or exposition or something like that. 
Um, and this seems to have come over into Christian liturgy. Sometimes it's just said it's brought over from synagogue service. I don't know that we have enough information on Christian liturgy before 400 to just say that, well, there was synagogue service and then we just took it and stuck it right here. And then, and then we had the, the, the commemoration of uh, the Eucharist over here and stuck them together. Uh, that's misleading. And I'm pretty sure uh, everybody's going to say we don't have enough from that period to say that. But it would certainly at least be appropriate to say that it's analog to what Jewish converts to Christianity would have expected. They would have expected a, a, a something like the recitation of the word of God um, uh, followed, followed by uh, the primary sacrificial activity. Um, so in any case, then there's the question of the lectionary cycle. Um, in the earliest um, uh, sources we have, it seems that uh, the Christians uh, read the Bible in sequence, and then depending on area, uh, they the, the length of the reading and the amount of the reading seems to have varied early on. Uh, it, it, some things I've read indicate that it might have gone on ad libitum, just sort of as much as the uh, congregation um, wanted to do for a given day. Uh, some sources seem to indicate that um, it might go on uh, for a certain a fixed amount of time, but that you were sort of, certainly in the Roman rite, you were going in sequence. So um, uh, consider the, we don't, I don't know that we, um, now we say sort of a reading from, but in the in the prior rite, it was sequentia uh, sancti evangeliae uh, secundum or whatever, you know, and, but that, that's indicated it's, it's a sequence is the point. Like that is to say, it's a, a, as it says in English, a continuation of the gospel of Mark, uh, the gospel according to Matthew. Well, what do you mean by a continuation? Well, it means last time we were reading the prior part and this time we're reading the next part. Um, and you go sort of in a sequence and you get all of it. Um, at least certainly that was the liturgical scholarship about the lectionary. Some may dispute with me on that, but that that's that was mainstream mid-century. And um, uh, in the contemporary right, we've certainly kept the idea of trying to go through not all of the Bible, but large parts of the Bible in sequence, especially the New Testament. Um, in the older right, um, the sequences, weekday sequences is, is weird um, and is very, con I haven't looked at the history of it, is, but once you get Jungman up on it, it's very convoluted. So we, I won't try to summarize that. But the, the Sunday sequence, uh, at least part of the Sunday sequence is just Paul, at least after Pentecost, the Sunday sequence is just Paul's epistles in a, in a, in a particular unbroken order. And then um, the, the Gospels appear to have been uh, uh, keyed to the epistles by theme. Um, however, there's a point, I think it's four or five weeks in, where the gospel sequence gets out of line. So um, it doesn't work exactly. But if you shift it back, they're still in line thematically. And I'd have to read the scholarship on that. But in any case, the principle of organization uh, uh, previously on the Sunday cycle seems to have been thematic, led by Paul's epistles, with, of course, some changes for different feasts, etc., and different days, etc. And in the contemporary rite, I, I don't. We'd have to go through the principles on the Sunday sequence because they're laid out. But um, there does seem to be a thematic correlation on the Sunday cycle. But it's sort of more through the three readings, uh, and uh, sort of there's of course an idea to get through more material. Whenever you think of that idea. Um, and again, the whole purpose of this section of the liturgy is to. Christ goes around with us in his earthly ministry. Christ went around with the apostles, went around with the entire Christian brethren and taught them. OK, he educated them and he was present to them as authoritative teacher. That is to say, um, and this was very important because as opposed to what, as opposed to uh, prophetic authority, which is not final, and as opposed even to mo uh, you know, the Mosaic authority of the scribes and the Pharisees, who have an authority, but it's not a final authority. The, the, the 
uh, the authority of the prophets and the authority, especially of the scribes and the Pharisees, is, a, is an authority of judgment. That is to say, they can make rule, they can make rulings about the law, and that's how you get, you know, sort of very elaborate rabbinic law. But they don't have authority to. They don't have authority to do things like when Christ shows up and says, uh, uh, Moses gave you right of divorce because of your hardness of hearts, and that's not how it was at the beginning. So I say, you shall not that you know you shall not divorce. That the scribes and Pharisees don't have the authority to do, nor do they have the authority to do any of the other um, very authoritative proclamations of Christ. And what we, in a certain way, what we do in the liturgy of the word is we make actually present through the, the, the signs, through the veil of the liturgy of the word, we make actually present this authority of Christ in our concrete lives so that we might actually experience it here and now. Here and now, right now, for us, among us. Uh, Christ didn't take it with him, as it were, when he ascended. It's still with us every day, every time you go to the liturgy. Um, and that's a big deal. I mean, he went around for however many, you know, three, four years uh, with the apostles, and clearly it was uh, core to their formation. So it, it can't be nothing. Was it an accident? You know, uh, no. It seems to be that his ministrative function was key to Christian formation. So if we don't have it, it much like it would be much like we don't have the the bishops are here to provide a certain kind of presence of Christ in our lives. Well, what's the instructive presence? Well, it's not just accidental. It's not just every once in a while when the Pope issues an encyclical or something. It's essential and daily and liturgical and core to the sacramental life. Namely, you're instructed every time you go to Mass, as well as in the divine office, you're instructed. Let's see. Uh, after this, let me pull up my parts so I don't lose. Uh, yeah. So after this, in the old right, I should have the homily. Uh, homily is interesting. Uh, my books say little about it because, as it were, it's up to the pre. It's up to the priest in a certain way. Uh, but again, it's just a continuation of the living instructive presence of Christ. It's Christ's living instructive presence is not simply the letter of Scripture, but it's also the letter of Scripture as made manifest through his minister, the priest, who is his presence in a particular way. Um, after this, of course, you have the profession of faith, this, the creed, usually um, uh, uh, Nicene, Const uh, Nicene Constant. Uh, the creed. I don't know why I can't pronounce it today. Um, and uh, uh, this creed, uh, the use of the creed and the placement of the creed here is not constant through history. Um, and in fact, wasn't in the Roman Rite until later. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it, 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 is, uh, it, it is present in, in most of the rites of the church at some point point in the liturgy. It's not necessary that it be put here, although it does seem fitting that it be put in the instructive part. Although sometimes, I mean, if you, in the sacramentaries, it's sometimes found before before communion. It's sometimes found, sometimes I think it was found after the offertory. It's, it's been moved around. Um, uh, then, of course, in the contemporary rite, this was subtracted from the Roman rite at a point, you have the uh, intercessions or the prayers of the faithful. Um, these, um, in the old, in, after they were subtracted, um, the, uh, you would still have as, as part of the, the, the collect would tend to, you, because you would have doublings of, of things. So it would, the collect would end up sort of serving their function. Uh, but of course the, one of the points of bringing it back in is to unite the the uh, the those assisting at the mass with the entire activity of uh, uh of of the the liturgical act so you know it's it's not just that 
because this is a large concern in the middle of the 20th century. It's not just that those guys up there are praying and then we're over here doing our thing. It's that those guys up there are praying and we pray with them and they pray for us and uh, they pray those prayers that we bring to them, they pray for and with us as well. They bring those uh, offerings of prayer to uh, God the Father through the Son. Um, and then uh, appropriately after this, um, we, we begin the offertory. Um, so the um, uh, offertory consists of a number of things. Um, so you have the preparation of the gifts. So here's here's the sequence. Preparation, then this is the present sequence. Preparation of the altar and presentation of the gifts. Prayers at the preparation of the gifts, mixing of water and wine, the lavabo, the washing hands, and prayer over the offering. That's roughly corresponds to the prior order, although the content of the Mass is different. Um, and uh, it's at this point we, we enter properly into the liturgy of the Eucharist. This is the gateway into the Eucharist and out of the liturgy of the Word. Um, he wants to say, and uh, this is Miller, so I don't want to, because uh, the the subtlety on the um, the subtlety on the offertory is important. So let's see. Okay. For such a right which comes before the real moment of sacrifice, we can conceive a priori two fundamental purposes. One, the preparation of the material of sacrifice, bringing gifts to the altar, placing them and arranging them there. And two, a more immediate preparation of the offerers before they enter the Holy of Holies. The most sacred moment of the sacrificial action, that is. The offertory is not an offering of gifts to God, except insofar as they are intrinsically ordered to sacrifice, or they are, as it were, so-called antitypes of what is truly offered, and only thus acquire a dedication to God. Theologically speaking, the church has no interest in the bread and the wine, except insofar as they are the so-called sacraments, sacramentals symbols of the true sacrificial victim, Christ. It is not the bread and wine which are sacrificed, but the body and blood of Christ. Only at the moment of transubstantiation are these gifts transformed into the immediate matter of sacrifice. And only after that, in the Unde et Memores, can and does the church speak in the strict sense of offering the sacrificial victim. If the offertory prayers speak of offering when the celebrant raises the bread and wine heavenward, they speak it in an anticipatory sense. That is, the grace asked for is looked forward to, not by reason of the presentation of the thing that is being made at this moment, but rather by virtue of the Eucharistic sacrifice that is to take place. Thus also must be understood such terms as ostium immaculatum, celum votaris, where speak the true sacrificial victim were present. So again, um, be, why is this? Why is this important? It's important because you don't want to think that there's two sacrifices, and the first one is a sacrifice of bread and wine. That's not the idea. Um, there is a preparation for actual sacrifice and a union of the faithful with the coming sacrifice in the offertory. Um, in the contemporary rite, uh, there's also uh, been restored. Uh, uh, the, I mean, it was still kind of in, it depends on what year. Uh, but this is would be appropriate place in the liturgy where if you have things you're offering, they were brought up in some way to the altar. And this would not include simply um, the bread and wine, but also things like um, money, 
uh, things like animals, things like oil and uh, uh, spices and other things that might be offered to the church. And, um, and of course, these things aren't sacrificed, strictly speaking. But our act here is a preparatory act for the strict sacrifice that's made and in union with it. Um, let's see. Uh, and this might be, uh, we might stop here after the um, description of the uh, offertory because Michael usually doesn't like to go much over an hour. Uh, but I wanted to discuss um, the length of the offertory prayers and their history very briefly. Let's see. Okay. Where was it? Um, in the original Roman rite, the only prayer recited by the celebrant during the offertory was the so-called secret. And they also speak about the lavabo. The lavabo was done here, but it was previously done by the deacon. Uh, we don't need to talk about that. Uh, but I only mean to talk about that because uh, here he says it. In the primitive plan for the Roman offertory rite, the only formulas spoken or sung were the antiphon and the secret. The first to accompany the people's oblation, as to say, you say the, the antiphon as people are, are bringing up their sacrifice or as the sacrifice is being brought up, uh, the materials, let's say the gifts. This is the contemporary liturgy is actually pretty good to distinguish the gifts from the sacrifice. The second to conclude and orientate this oblation to the sacrifice, oblation to the sacrifice. So it's an oblation and then a sacrifice. This is very this is important because you don't want to say, oh, we got like 15 sacrifices going on, some of them of money. That's weird. All else is Gallican addition, at least as far as the use of this particular moment of the Mass is concerned. The lavabo, for instance, seems to have taken place in the Roman Rite after the oblation of the faithful, but before the oblation of the clerics. However, it was not the pontiff, the prime minister, the chief minister, who washed his hands, but rather the archdeacon who had to arrange the oblation on the altar. So basically, the, in the primitive rite, the, I mean, it makes sense now that the single priest would do it, but um, in, the, uh, in the, the washing of the hands is about handling the sacred vessel. Um, from the very beginning, the whole purpose of such an action was symbolic. That is to say, purification before beginning the canons, before beginning the canon. In fact, other documents have the celebrant wash his hands several times. That is, once at the very beginning of the offertory before accepting the oblation, again before receiving the oblation of the clergy. In other words, the closer one approached to the Holy of Holies, the more one felt the need for purification. Um, and let's see, also the water is blessed here. That is ancient, but um, we can chase it down to the Leonine Sacramentary. Uh, and let's see, and that's sort of the end on the offertory. I think, so I've said a lot, and uh, I don't like to do structural lectures without uh, going to the audience anyway. So let's, I think we should pull out and see about audience participation see if Michael wants to talk about anything and then go forward and we'll probably conclude the show within the next 30 minutes, I would think. Uh, we have less time than that, but I do see some chat questions that I wanted to get to. What is the difference between the Gallican Rite and the Roman Rite? Um, and when was the Gallican Rite suppressed? Um, I'll, so that'll be more covered in the... Um, in the historical lectures, and I don't have that to mind, the exact dates to mind, but the Gallican Rite was practiced. So Rome, the, the province of Rome is, is uh, Rome in uh, immediate areas around Italy. And then the Gallican Rite seems to have been, um, and this is from purely from memory, I have not prepped to give you the whole historical structure of uh, the whole historical distinction. So that'll be later. That's probably two lectures from now. But uh, the Gallican Rite seems to have been th those rites celebrated primarily in um, uh, th those parts of Europe, uh, north, uh, east of Italy, um, and maybe some 
to the West as well. It's, uh, it seems to have been, the my understanding seems to have been what got um, distributed by Charlemagne for the most part, or, so, or those kingdoms. Uh, so, um, uh, and it's suppression. Uh, I'm not exactly sure when it totally goes away, but uh, I think it's suppression seems to be by the high middle ages, if I recall. And that, that has to do with imperial interaction with Rome. Um, but the distinction, um, I only have loose distinctions. We'd have to go into detail, but it seems that the, that the Gallican rites tended to be, um, they tended to have somewhat of an Eastern influence in that they were very, very elaborate, uh, but they also tended to enjoy symbolism. And in fact, many of the allegorical gestures and many of the interpretive, uh, not now usually abandoned, but many of the old interpretive ideas we had about the mass uh, tended to be Gallican uh, in character. That is to say that was, the people they would think this is a, a group people thought very symbologically about the liturgy. And there's nothing wrong with that, but um, you know, there's also no, re like, I mean, you have a changing right. So any symbology that's based on a later edition is can't be primitive to the right. Even if you want to say that well, not, like for instance, the one that comes to mind is that the, uh, the, so the, 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 arrangement of the Kyrie into three Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Christe eleison, Kyrie eleison. That's, that was thought to be Trinitarian. That's a Gallican interpretation, very symbological, and it's not primitive to the right because the Kyrie might have gone on for 16, 18, 19 verses. Um, we got five minutes here and we got two questions. So let's okay. take this one. Father John, I'm dedicated to helping extraordinary form mass going Catholics feel more at home in my Novus Ordo parishes. What's the best way to do that? What options should I choose? Um, so, um, of course, and I, I do both and I've always enjoyed both as long as they're done well. Um, the, the extreme form of that is St. John Cantius, how they do their masses. You can get them live streamed. Um, uh, and I think they still have them in both forms, but they've been dedicated to performing both side by side. And they go so far as, and you could do this. They go so far as to insert the prayers at the foot of the altar, um, before, uh, before Novus Ordo masses. And you can do that because no, the Novus Ordo rubrics are actually sufficiently flexible that you could do whatever you want right before the mass. Uh, so uh, you could do that if you wanted. I think that's a little much, but I'm going to say at the very least, step one, look at the rubrics of the mass and treat them seriously and treat them as seriously as you would treat the rubrics of the extraordinary form mass. And you want those like at the don't like you, you want the reverences and you want the high reverences and you want them uh, to be, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, very forward. Like you, you come out and you, you do the, uh, you know, you do the, you reverence the altar at the beginning, you know, that needs to be a real reverence. That does some priests come out and I'm not bad mouthing anybody in particular. Some priests come out, walk in front of the altar, look down, back up, pop. Hey, everybody, how we doing? That's not how you want to do it. That needs to be a real moment of, of reverence. Um, you know, uh, of course, if you can have processions, uh, of course, if you can have good vestments, use incense, um, uh, especially the use of incense is important. Um, the actual treatment, like some of this stuff is just doing the stuff right. Like the antiphons should be chanted as much as possible. The, um, if you can chant the readings, that's great. If you can, I understand, but the stuff that's listed to be chanted, like the antiphons, the Psalms, or if you use the, um, uh, I can't remember, we'll go over this in another lecture, but if, if you use the Psalm alternative that needs to be chanted and it's done serious, it doesn't need to be this blah, 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 stuff in the liturgy of the word. The blah, 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 blah character of the liturgy of the word usually does the worst to introduce the Novus Ordo to people who want as it were, a more reverent rite. Because it's, and this is because it's in English. It's because it's in the vernacular and people feel like they can just blah, 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 blah. Well, if that's your attitude, about, if you need to speak in Latin to speak reverently, something's wrong with you. Like, that's not correct. So you don't, don't have, at no point in the liturgy should you be blah, 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 blah. You should, you, you know, it, it, every bit of it should be elevated because why? We're talking to God. We're, we're serious now. We're not asleep. Even if, I mean, even charismatics understand, you know, you might speak oddly, 
But at least remember you're talking to God. That's the most important thing. And then the ceremonials, follow them and do them exactly and don't be lazy. And that's the biggest thing. And again, I recommend St. John Cantius' uh, Novus Ordo Masses as a, a guide. Uh, and then I know we've got not, not a lot of time, so I don't want to go on too long. This is from Richard. Thank you for the super chat. Uh, Traditionus Custodis says that all the elements of the Roman Rite can be found in the Novus Ordo. Is this correct? Are the elements preserved in the Novus Ordo simply too basic and common to other liturgies to represent real preservation of the TLM? Um, so again, this is the, this is something I didn't... Francis has unfortunately forced my hand on this. So I can say in one sense, yes, he's correct. That, and this was always the idea. We've preserved the Roman Rite in the sense that We've gone, it's it's a resourcement preservation. So we've gone back to primitive sources and you can see, I don't, it's not a, lib, it's not a liberal reform really at all. Like a, you, like for I always go to John Miller. John Miller's uh, Fundamentals of the Liturgy from 1955 is really grounding. Namely, he's got all the sources and whenever he talks about reform of the liturgy that, that was was being worked on at the time, it's always, well, the the sources of the Roman Rite express this spirit, express this idea, and so we want to get back to that. That's what it means to resource, to get back to the sources, and not in a merely antiquarian way where we just do whatever we can find in the Leonine Sacramentary or whatever. No, but in a sense of what's the primitive right doing and what's been lost, how can we recover it? And what's been put over uh, the top of it, if it's not useful, can that be stripped away? Now, you might not agree with that reform principle, but that's an old reform principle in the Roman right. That's how popes always want to reform the liturgy whenever they do it. It's always a, a, a recovery and a stripping away, and that happened numerous times. Um, whether or not you like this result. And I would say that certainly, spiritually, certainly in terms of the primitive elements of the sources of the Roman rite, yes, the contemporary rite preserves the Roman rite. But if you want to say, well, it looks different, well, yes, it does look different. And all of the pieces, all of the ritual parts, well, obviously it's not that we don't have the prayers at the foot of the altar anymore, but that's not, the, the point is those aren't essential to the rite in the first place. Um, and of course, in, in older documents about this, I mean, the Roman canon is preserved nearly intact. So, I mean, it's going to be weird to say that, look, we have total discontinuity and that it's just like the Eastern rites. Well, the Eastern rites don't have the Roman canon. So that's not right. That's incorrect. That's ill thought. Uh, if you want to talk about the other canons, the, the other anaphora as well, they're brought from different sources. And uh, well, I mean, one of them is a, an adaptation of the uh, Hippolytan canon, which is a Western canon, so it's not dumb to use it. Uh, but we'd, we'd have to talk about history, and that's part of a, a later lecture we have to go into. But he's not wrong, but it has to be understood in a particular way. And if you, what you understand him to mean is that, well, all the part, if you go to a, a, an extraordinary form mass and then you go to a Novus Ordo mass, all the parts of the extraordinary form mass, it, ritual parts, are going to be in the Novus Ordo Mass, that's obviously false, but that's not what he's talking about. And that, But that's not what any of the liturgical reformers were talking about, and that's not what the church wants you to care about. It's not about whether all the ritual parts are there. It's about whether or not what's essential and important to the right has been preserved, and that's the argument of the reformers and of the popes and of the church about the reform. You might not agree with that, but they aren't talking about whether or not all the little word pieces are there. That's, and anyway, that's weird. That's externalist anyway. That's not the idea. River, I appreciate you coming on and doing this, and I look forward to the next one. Go ahead and put in a plug for your own channel and, and anything else that you want to make. Well, I've got a I've got a channel, River Run, that I haven't been I got a little depressed, so I didn't maintain it. But I, I might hopefully get back to it. And the next episode, I'll plug the next episode. The next episode is obviously the rest of the liturgy of the Eucharist and the concluding rites, and then this whole series after this is to be uh, uh, the rest of the parts of the liturgy, and then the history of the Mass. So there's at least two or three lectures on the history of the Mass, uh, a history of the reform of the Mass, uh, and then the last episode, I don't know how many of those will be, are on liturgical polemics, which is to say arguments people have about the liturgy. And I, I don't know, that could take one to, to ten episodes. But it's important because of what, the situation we've got ourselves embroiled in and the lack of good apologetics on the matter. 
Excellent. Thank you, River. I look forward to having you on. And uh, everybody, thank you all for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, as I normally say, if you haven't already. And also check me out, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you want to support me. Also, hit the join button if you want to just become a member here on the YouTube uh, channel. And you'll get access to extra perks either way if you do Patreon or YouTube. Uh, so which, whichever one you prefer is fine with me. All right, that's going to do it. See y'all later. See you God next time, Michael. Yeah. Hey, RNT fans, if you're looking to buy a home or sell a home and would like a realtor who shares your beliefs, be sure to check out our sponsor, realestateforlife.org, and be sure to tell them 